Hey everyone, it's Maggie Bat with Vlogist Day something. Um, <laughs> it's probably the 23rd. Uh, so, I um, I have a friend in town, Nicholas Co. from Twitter. Uh, we've been friends for just about a year now. I mean, like, friend friends that talk outside of just Twitter. <laughs> Um, but they're in town, so we've been playing games, and today there's going to be more games as soon as I'm done with this. I'm going to get them up, and we're going to go play games, but I was super excited. So they showed me Yunnan yesterday. Um, this is an Argentum Verlog game that came out a couple years back. I think 2013 is what we agreed on. Um, and unfortunately, I knew about it, got excited about it, really wanted to play it, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Um, and for a long time, it wasn't even available through regular distribution in the States. And this year, when Passport Game Studios um, made a partnership with Argentum Verlog, it very quietly landed in stores in about April. To no applause or anything. Um, and so it's just kind of sat languishing on shelves. I don't think it's even selling at the moment, but it's such a fabulous game that I was super excited so I got to play it. And um, for any of you that follow my Instagram or my Twitter, you saw that it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, the big old board, it's like the centerpiece. And what's really nice is that you don't really have a tableau or anything, so it's not much of a table hog, which almost everything I've been playing lately has been tableau builders. So it's actually kind of nice when you can centralize the game all in one place. Um, so in the game, it is two to five players, uh, probably three to five players, sorry. I've heard nothing but gripes about the two-player version of this. However, Nicholas said that if you control uh, two two entities in the game, so if you control two colors but use the same score marker, that's how they dealt with the two-player. To each their own, I probably won't get around to trying it, but the game is fabulous for lots of players. Um, famously mean. It's, it's very competitive, and it's not apologetic at all, so if you have more favor with the king and you and your movement in the same space as me, I'm getting knocked back. So you can lose a lot of money by having someone knock you out of the spaces. So you have to just either compete on the favor track or know that that's going to happen and do other things. What's fantastic, which I forgot in the first like eight times I filmed this vlog, um, the economy in this game is such where at the end of the round, you calculate how much money everybody's earned. So your guys on different places, and I'll go over a little bit of the gameplay in a second, but wherever they are, they earn money. And you calculate that, and that decides your turn order for the next turn. And then in turn order, you decide how much of that is money, and how much of that is straight up victory points, one to one. So if I earned 25 money for the round, but I only need six to get the actions I need next round, I take 19 points. And um, the game is triggered to be over when someone reaches 80 points, or if all the gifts on the board are gone, but the, don't worry about that. Um, so 80 points, so there's definitely two strategies, and I was very scared about this because I kind of remember hearing about this when the game came out, that in the game you can pay as many points, you can go as negative as you like, and so two of the players in our four-player game went all the way down to like negative, I want to say it was like negative 10 or something, and then you kind of raise up a bunch of stuff and you boomerang back around and you just do that with one fell swoop or you can kind of do what I do and just take a little points, take a little points, take a little points and build an engine. I never went negative. I actually never paid points for for money in the game which in future plays I may try a more negative strategy and more like pay it up front to get more stuff later but I didn't compete very heavily on the trail which is a big part of the game. So, um, in the game you have um, different action spots that you can bid on, and then you have like a trail that you're walking along. And the trail is where you get a lot of points. Um, the bidding spots, though, they give you either a house, a favor, uh, a horse, an extra guy, or a uh, missing one. Oh, the number of movements you have per turn. Um, so you put a guy on there, and you're saying, I'm going to pay five for that action. Someone else can come along and say they're going to pay seven for the same action, and they bump you, you get your guy back. Or you can take one of the three more expensive spots, and no one bumps you out. So if I pay 9 for it, you can pay 12 for it, and we both get the action. Uh, so you're bidding, you're bidding, you're bidding, you're bidding, you're going around the table until everyone runs out of guys. At some point, if you like, you can put guys down in the puer, puer, um, and that's going to be the guys that walk along the trail. And you can put a guy in the bank. 
and the bank is really neat. So when you put a guy there, you take all your bids and you put them into poor. Um, and then you get, at the end of the bidding round, you get money based on how high all the other bids were. So if people are bidding it up and just going crazy, you could net a whole lot of money and get a whole lot of guys to move around um, later that round. You just don't get any of those other things. So like the horse tells you how far you can move along the trail. Uh, the the movement tells you how many guys you can move, how many spaces. Um, you can get extra action pawns, which are really, really important because as you start moving up that trail, you're going to want to leave guys out and you'll have less guys for bidding. Um, and then that favor track, as I said, if you end your movement with another person and you have a higher favor than they do, you can knock them out. Um, and then the there's a there's a take a stuff. So at the beginning of the game, you don't have any of your stuff. You've got tea houses, trading houses, bridges. I think those are all the buildings. And so if you win that part of the bid, you get one of those buildings. Um, and the tea houses are limited, only one per province. There are five provinces, and each player has up to two houses, tea houses. Um, when you take that tea house, you can build it right away as long as your horse is far along enough. Um, the other buildings you kind of cash until during your movement steps, which is like the second phase after the bidding, um, you can build it wherever you are. And the other two types of buildings, the trading houses and the bridges, are not limited at all to how many players can have them. So the tea houses are really a race. They're worth 12 points. And what they do is they protect you from the tea inspector, the big gray maple. The big green meeple goes wherever the most money is being made in a round and knocks out um, a person there. And so you really, the high favor you had before is going to attract the tea inspector unless you have a tea house there. So lots of things to think about, lots of multi-layered things, but a very simple game. There's not that many rules. That's pretty much what I just said. Um, I'm really excited for this one. It was a little mean with just like people knocking you out and you're losing so many actions, but you just kind of have to expect it and try and find ways around it. Uh, the boomerang strategy did not work in our particular game. I, I won that one because I just consistently took points over money the whole time and spent very, very little. I took more bank spots than anyone else, um, which for better or worse, might not work again, might do just fine, who knows. Um, I was just really excited to try it. Um, the other games we played, we played a game of Nornbrook because <laughs> anyone that comes to Seattle, you're going to play Nornbrook with me. And we played uh, The Boss. The Boss was a little card game, it's kind of deduction-y. Um, it, it is uh, coming out to the States really, I think, next year, and it's from Blue Orange Games this time. Um, the original publisher, I don't know, because I don't have it. It's Nicholas this is. Um, but it was, it was a fun, nice little starter game for us, like a warm-up game. We played uh, a trick-taking game, which I will not remember, but it had... Uh, you. It's double-sided, so you can see the colors of everybody, and you're bidding one that you'll take the most color of and one that you'll take the least color of for you. And it's a interesting game, a little light for my trick-taking tastes. Um, I'm still I'm still tr struggling to find trick-taking card games that I like as much as just playing Spades or Oh Hell or something. So that's good, and we ended up the night with... Uh, Felix the Cat in the Sack. Just fun stuff. Um, for today, I'm going to go load up the game bag in a moment. Um, I'm thinking we'll probably get one big, chunky game and at least one medium game, if not more than that. We kind of have all day, but normally this is my day off, so no big video for me today, guys. This is it. Uh, that's all for me for now, and I hope you guys enjoyed. Check out Unan if you get a moment. You can find it pretty much everywhere now because it's totally available to order. Uh, Passport Games brought it in from Argentum Brilla. And uh, I will be playing this a lot more very soon. First, got to read the rule book, and then I'm going to play it a lot. Goodbye. Okay,